Hello! The Stock on Water Prize is the most prestigious award of its kind and uh, for the past three decades we have had the privilege of each year inviting our guests to a prize ceremony and a royal banquet at the beautiful City Hall of Stockholm. But as we all know by now, uh, unusual times call for unusual ceremonies and that is why we will be celebrating two Water Prize laureates here and now. For the year 2020, Dr. John Cherry for his important work concerning groundwater contamination. And the laureate for 2021, Sandra Postel, for helping the world understand major water issues. In a little while, a member of the Stockholm Water Prize nominating committee will provide us with a more detailed background for each of them. And after the official part here, uh, there will be an opportunity to meet the laureates as they will join us from Canada and the US, respectively, for a conversation on the topic of fresh water. But now, may I introduce to you His Majesty the King. Dear laureates, ladies and gentlemen, for 30 years, the Stockholm Water Prize has uh, honoured women, men and organisations for extraordinary water-related achievements. Through the years, I've had the privilege to present the prize to some of the world's most renowned authorities on conservation and protection of water resources. And I'm very proud to be the official patron of this prestigious award. Today, we honor two years laureates, Dr. John Sherry, and Sandra Postel, the 2020 Stockholm Water Prize laureate, Dr. John Sherry, is a champion of the world's most threatened and forgotten water resource, our groundwater. Since um, groundwater is out of sight, it is often also out of mind. Still, we all depend on it. Most of the planet's fresh water is in fact groundwater. Nearly half of the world's population use groundwater for drinking and it contributes to about half of the global food production. With climate change, groundwater will be even more important as a buffer against weather extremes. Already in the 1970s, Dr. Sherry raised the alarm that the world's groundwater was becoming increasingly contaminated. His pioneering work has led to a paradigm shift in groundwater research as well as new solutions and concrete methods to monitor and control contaminated groundwater. We need tireless and passionate advocates for groundwater protection. Thank you Dr. Shea for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most encouraging trends in the recent years is how more people seem to value nature and to see the importance of conservation. The 2021 Stockholm Water Prize Lords, Ms. Sandra Postel, has uh, greatly contributed to this. Through articles, videos, books and uh, documentaries, she has become one of the world's most influential science communicators. Thanks to her, students, decision makers and the public have learned about the role of water for both nature and society. As a leading authority on fresh water issues, Ms. Postel has made more people aware of the many challenges we face when it comes to global water management. Yet, her message is often quite optimistic and always inspiring. In recent years, she has focused on sharing examples with how water can be managed in a more sustainable manner. I'm convinced that we need this kind of innovative thinking more than ever. Thank you, Ms. Postel, for your contribution. Dear Loris, Professor Sherry, and Ms. Postel, my warmest congratulations on your outstanding achievements. I wish you both the best of luck in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you, Your Majesty. With us now from Stanford University in the US, a member of the Stockholm Water Prize nominating committee, Professor Stephen Gorelick. Globally, nearly half of all drinking water is provided by groundwater. We think of this underground and invisible source as pure and pristine, protected by its great depth and isolation. But sustainability of this critical resource has been threatened by human activities that have created groundwater contamination. Contamination has come from leaching of agricultural chemicals, disposal of landfill and septic waste, and discarding or leaking of industrial solvents and fuels. In the latter half of the 20th century, John Cherry became the driving creator of the field of contaminant hydrogeology, which has aimed to understand and deal with these pressing water quality problems that have threatened the integrity of our groundwater resources. A geologic engineer by trading, John pioneered new systematic approaches to remediate contaminated groundwater, developed key field measurement devices, and provided keen insights into contaminant transport processes. His over 220 publications have garnered over 38,000 citations, eclipsing everyone else in the field. John's research contributions have redirected engineering solutions based on fundamental understanding of geochemical and physical processes. For this, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and one is one of just 12 Canadians inducted into the US National Academy of Engineering. John's contributions to education and society go much farther. He has generously shared his knowledge for the benefit of all, with particular focus on supporting students and practitioners in the developing world. His textbook, Groundwater, co-authored with fellow Canadian Alan Fries, became the foundation of modern courses about groundwater hydrology and was the first to emphasize the science underlying subsurface contaminant fate and transport. The book was generously placed into the public domain, making it freely available in multiple languages. John also initiated the Groundwater Project, which develops a free online, globally accessible encyclopedia consisting of over 100 topical chapters on every aspect of groundwater hydrology as text and videos. Perhaps most significantly, John has exerted his influence well beyond the boundaries of the community of hydrogeologists. As a case in point, he has been instrumental in combating junk science and claims of the hydraulic fracturing or fracking petroleum industry. Indeed, he is a rare breed of those who are willing to put their personal reputations on the line to protect the integrity of science and ensure that it is applied in the best interest of humanity. With the Stockholm Water Prize, John Cherry is recognized for his contributions to science, education, practice, and for translating his well-earned stature into a fervent and highly effective advocacy for groundwater science. John's work has informed current and future policies, laws, and collective de deliberations that governments must establish to protect water, our most essential and most imperiled resource. Congratulations, John. The 2020 Stockholm Water Prize, Professor John Cherry, for changing the scientific paradigms of groundwater research. Members of the nominating committee, the Stockholm International Water Institute, dear colleagues and water friends, I am most pleased to receive the prize at this time for a few reasons. First, because it draws attention to the groundwater problem, part of the freshwater cycle. Groundwater is out of sight and mostly out of mind. Groundwater is in trouble and groundwater needs all the attention it can get. Second, I'm a dirty boot hydrogeologist and as such, I'm the first scientist in this category to receive this honor. By dirty boot, I mean that my scientific contributions come from going to the field, mostly where there's contamination, where we drill holes in the ground, to get data. I'm sure that the many dirty boot hydrogeologists around the world are pleased that one of theirs has been recognized in this way. 
Third, my strength as a scientist is collaboration with many other scientists, technicians, and administrators. All of my accomplishments have come from exploring ideas and equipment, evolved through dialogue, and working with others who have different talents, ideas, and skills. The selection of me for this prize helps to draw attention to the fact that we live in a world of global problems, and highly collaborative science is the only way these problems can be solved. Fourth, the research that I have done over the past five decades has been well supported all along by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC as it is called. This research has been expensive, so this honor gives me the stage to thank NSERC and the weary Canadian taxpayers for their continuous support over five decades. Fifth, but most importantly, I thank the colleagues who submitted my name with the paperwork as the first step towards this wonderful prize and the many students and colleagues I've worked with so enjoyably over the years. But what about the future? To receive this prize is invigorating. I am now working on a global education endeavor called the Groundwater Project to publish groundwater books free of charge in many languages online, to which I hope this honor will draw attention. Please check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, and congratulations, John Cherry. We move on to uh, this year's laureate. Back to you, Professor Gorelick, spokesperson of the Stockholm Water Prize Nominating Committee. Sandra Postel is a leading authority on water scarcity. Her ideas, commitment to the environment, and her ability to communicate and promote conservation and demand side rather than supply side freshwater policies make her the 2021 Stockholm Water Prize recipient. 30 years ago, water resource professionals generally promoted engineering interventions aimed at expanding water supply, largely by building dams, but they did not understand the consequences given the rapid spread of water scarcity. Sandra Postel saw what was coming. She wrote about it in, in a way that captured the world's attention and changed the water discourse. With her convincing arguments, she was able to sway water managers, educators, and the international community that demand management was the road leading to sustainability. Her award-winning book, The Last Oasis, Facing Water Scarcity, was groundbreaking and revolutionized the water resources management paradigm, resulting in a shift from augmenting water supply to managing demand for water worldwide. The book has been translated into eight languages. She highlighted the untapped potential of conservation as the last oasis. Sandra's work demonstrates her commitment to water for the environment. Throughout her career, Sandra asked hard questions and pushed for solutions that required buy-in beyond the norm. In particular, Sandra's commitment to water for the environment has been firm. In forums, corporate conference rooms, and speeches, regardless of the audience, Sandra advocated for water solutions that meet the needs of people, business, and the environment. The key element of Sandra's work is her impact. The paradigm shift that she has been driving is not just about the type of projects and strategies implemented on the ground. She has promoted a new water ethic that has driven policy changes with improved real world outcomes. In 1994, she founded and led the Global Water Policy Project which gave water issues the visibility they deserved in the global desire for sustainable development. Since then, Sandra's influence put her in an elite class of water activists and professionals. She did this through building awareness, writing, and directly engaging in catalytic solutions. At the National Geographic Society, she served as the lead water expert for the Society's Freshwater Initiative. She has demonstrated her ability to work easily with academia and far beyond it with policymakers, scientists, NGOs, grassroots organizations, students, and the general public. Finally, Sandra has no equal in her effectiveness in communicating the water messages that we need to hear. Sandra has published extensively journal articles, magazine essays, her books. She has appeared on many productions and stages around the world sharing her knowledge of water. She is in high demand as a keynote speaker, and she is always at the top of the list of media writers seeking 
and authoritative voice on the water issues of the day. As an educator, she motivates students who see her as a role model for their own careers. The Stockholm Water Prize recognizes Sandra Postel as an outstanding thought leader, brilliant, passionate communicator, and tremendous inspiration to those in the water community and beyond. Congratulations, Sandra, for leading the way. The 2021 Stockholm Water Prize Laureate, Sandra Postel, United States of America, for being a world-leading authority on water scarcity and one of the world's greatest water communicators and educators. Members of the nominating committee, the Stockholm International Water Institute, dear colleagues and water friends, I am so deeply honored to be named the 2021 Stockholm Water Prize Laureate. It is truly the honor of a lifetime. I thank the Stockholm International Water Institute and everyone involved in my nomination for this prestigious prize for their support. It is both humbling and a welcome affirmation that what I've been doing for all these years has, has made a difference. The fundamental question at the core of nearly all of my work is quite simple. If water is finite, essential to life, and there are no substitutes for it, then how do we meet our human needs for water while ensuring we sustain the web of life? The collaborations I have shared with so many wonderful colleagues, I wish I could name you all, but you know who you are, have made this exploration deeply satisfying engaging, and fun. So thank you all, and we're not done yet. I'm not the easiest person to be around when I'm writing a book or preparing a talk. I thank my family and my friends for their love, patience, and encouragement throughout this journey, and also for all of the deep conversations that have opened my mind to new ideas. Only because of you is this honor filled with joy. Lastly, I am so grateful to the creators and the sustainers of the Stockholm Water Prize for each year shining a bright light on fresh water for all the world to see. There is nothing more important. So thank you very, very much. Congratulations and thank you, Sandra Postel. As I mentioned, a conversation between the two laureates will take place here in just a few minutes. But right now I am joined by the Executive Director of CV, the Stockholm International Water Institute, Torgny Holmgren, and the Chairman of the CV Board, Peter Forsman. Thank you. His Majesty the King of Sweden, Carl Gustav, has uh, congratulated the laureates of 2020 and 21. And under normal circumstances, there would be a prize ceremony and a banquet with royal presence. What does the involvement of His Majesty the King and the royal family mean for the Stockholm Water Prize? The genuine interest in water issues from His Majesty the King has been essential to the Stockholm Water Prize from the very beginning and throughout these three first decades. And the whole royal family share this interest. Hmm. Her Royal Highness, the Crown Princess, is the patron of the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And this is a great inspiration for all participants in this worldwide competition among young water innovators. At the same time, the presence of His Majesty the King and Her Royal Highness at the two prize award ceremonies, of course, adds the prestige of the prizes and also attracts the interest of a worldwide audience of decision makers. Mm. And what about the ongoing pandemic? How has that affected uh, the prize? Well, of course, the pandemic unfortunately meant that we couldn't have the prize award ceremony for Stockholm Water Prize Laureate last year at the World Water Week as we normally have. Instead, we have had the prize award ceremony, a joint one this year for both the 2020 and 2021 prize award laureates. 
So that is, of course, the advantage. Advantage is also that we have had the possibility now to attend an attendance from the worldwide audience as it's screened online, as the Digital World Water Week also screened online this year. Mm -hmm. Now, three decades of Stockholm Water Prize, that means that we have by now celebrated a huge variety of water knowledge. Uh, what do the two laureates that we have seen here and celebrate, what do they have in common? They have both changed our understanding of freshwater problems. Dr. Cherry was the first to raise the alarm about the threats from groundwater contamination. And Sandra Postel made people aware of a looming global water crisis. And they have both helped decision makers to find new approaches and solutions. Mm. And we will meet them both very soon. But... Before we do that, is there anything more you would like to add? I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Stockholm Water Prize Nominating Committee and the Royal Swedish Academy of Science for their rigorous review and reflection in the selection of the distinct laureate. Thank you, Peter. I couldn't agree more. Last but not least, let me express my heartfelt thanks to the City of Stockholm and the Stockholm Water Prize founders Bacardi, Ålandsbanken, Grundfos Foundation, Water Environment Federation Asylum. Over the years you have remained heartfully and steadfully committed to the success of the prize and without you we wouldn't be able to have this award ceremony today. So thank you. And finally congratulations Professor John Cherry. And congratulations Miss Sandra Postel. Thank you gentlemen. It is now finally time to meet the laureates, but before that, let's enjoy some beautiful images of Stockholm on water. Here in Stockholm, our water seems self-evident, not just in beautiful views, boat rides and swimming. Stockholm has more than one million residents, each of whom consumes 50 gallons of purified water every day. We shower with it, brush our teeth, do laundry, wash dishes, and drink it. Most of us don't think about the fact that there is hard and long-term work behind each drop. It's easy to take clean water for granted, but that hasn't always been the case. Back in the mid-19th century, due to the Industrial Revolution and massive urbanization, there was a reign of filth that led to major cholera outbreaks. In 1855, the city decided to build a water supply network and drinking water treatment plant. In 1861, Stockholmers could, for the first time, drink municipal, purified drinking water. This access to clean water changed the lives and health of Stockholmers. The city continued to grow and evolve. The downside was that the wastewater contaminated Stockholm's water, which by the 1930s resulted in a ban on swimming in Lake Malaren. The city's first wastewater treatment plant was built, shortly followed by two more. The swimming ban wouldn't be lifted until the mid-1970s. Clean drinking water and effective wastewater treatment have played important roles in the shaping of contemporary Stockholm. Thanks to the decisions made in years past, we can now enjoy the world's best water. It's a natural home for the World Water Week and the Stockholm Water Prize. But the work is not over. We face new challenges. In order to allow the city to grow and evolve, we need more effective wastewater treatment, carefully considered rainwater management, and increased drinking water production. As climate change brings more rain and heavier downpours, the risk of flooding and contamination increases. In a densified city, there are fewer green spaces that can absorb the precipitation. But there are solutions. Stockholm is now working to improve the quality of all of its water. And Slusen is being reconstructed to cope with climate change and safeguard the drinking water. We currently have access to the world's best water. By cooperating internationally, we can help each other to protect our water for generations to come. Welcome to Stockholm. 
Joining us now from Nova Scotia, Canada, our groundwater expert and the Stockholm Water Prize laureate of 2020, John Cherry. Welcome and congratulations. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And this year's laureate, longtime freshwater researcher with us from New Mexico in the US, Sandra Postel. Congratulations to you as well and welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You have both been celebrated for your groundbreaking work. And of course, we all agree on the fact that understanding is important. But there is also an imminent need for change when it comes to water problems. And this need for change applies to individuals, society, but also to policy and decision makers. And we will talk about all of this. But let's begin with asking both of you, what is the one thing that you would wish everyone to understand about water? Let's start with you, John. Well, I hope that everyone will start to realize that uh, water is in a global crisis uh, and we have the climate change crisis, but we also have the water crisis. And both of those have to be worked on at the same time because in a way they're, they're independent. If we didn't have the uh, climate crisis, we would still have the water crisis. And uh, soon half of the population of 10 billion people will be under some form of water stress, water poverty, uh, or, uh, or water scarcity. And I think we have to realize that as a society and, and bear down and make the changes that uh, will help get us out of this bad trajectory. What about you, Sandra? What is your one thing? I would say my one thing is, is that water is, is vital to all life on the planet. So we really can't take that for granted. And that we should not view water as a commodity. Most fundamentally, it is the basis of life. And so valuing it that way, managing it that way is, is most important. Hmm. Sandra, you have said that the, the past is no longer a guide for the here and now and much less for the future. In your most recent book, Replenish, you write about uh, solutions to water challenges that work with nature instead of against it. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, you know, we, we do have this climate and water challenge happening at the same time, and we do need to solve both at the same time. And so we, we are beginning to see the effects of having broken the water cycle in the way that we do, and droughts and floods are going to become more severe. And so building a more resilient water system is really critical. And we can do that by working more with nature rather than against it. You know, we have this amazing infrastructure, 60,000 large dams and canals and pipelines bringing water all around. It's, it's really impressive. And yet much of that is, is working against the water cycle. So if we think, for example, about how we're going to control worsening floods, we have a couple choices. We can make the levees higher, we can make the dams higher, or we can begin to reconnect rivers with their natural floodplains. Strategically, of course, we can't do all of that. But that will solve multiple problems at the same time. We'll be controlling floods, we'll be recharging groundwater, we'll be reestablishing habitat for birds and fish and wildlife, and we'll be putting carbon back in the soil, which mitigates climate change. So that's one example of a choice of how we can manage floods differently that builds resilience and solves multiple problems at the same time. And there are many more examples of that. As you said in my book, I have many of them. Um, but those are what inspire me that we can actually turn some of these trends around. Um, and I think we need to move more in, in that direction, healing the water cycle rather than further breaking it. Hmm. John, your contribution to a better, more widespread understanding of the issues at hand is the Groundwater Project. What is the idea behind it? Well, the idea behind the groundwater project is that groundwater goes unseen and is out of mind, yet 99% of all fresh water is groundwater. So half the water that flows in rivers is groundwater from base flow, etc. So the groundwater project uh, involves collecting hundreds of experts from around the world uh, who have been invited to write books, um, which the groundwater project then edits and reviews and publishes online 
for free of charge access uh, everywhere. And then also we translate them into many languages. And of course, one of the problems with water is the lack of lack of understanding, understanding the hydrologic cycle. Uh, so the idea of the Groundwater Project is to develop a, a level playing field for all people in all languages across the world, going all the way from children's books on up to university books so that we all understand the problems, at least in the same light because it'll take a global effort to, uh, to do, as Sandra was mentioning, to get back in harmony uh, with water uh, and nature. Mm. And as you said, available to all, free of charge? Free of charge. Just, just download and sign up if you want. If you don't want to sign up, then you can get pieces of it. And we have uh, 13 books out there. And also we're, we're also publishing old classic books that have been lost that today's students don't know about. So the idea is to basically to democratize uh, groundwater knowledge and, and beyond that, to democratize water knowledge for everybody in the world to get to understand and know. So people can be informed to put pressure on their political representatives because that's, that's ultimately where it has to end up to get change. Exactly. To me personally, groundwater seems very important indeed, since half the world, world's population depend, depend on it. Yet, John, you claim that groundwater education and research, research is often trivialized and, and even forgotten. How is that even possible? Well, science advances by professors and other researchers operating in specialty silos. And, and increasingly our silos are narrower and narrower. So much of what's published now in the scientific literature is incomprehensible, except to those few people who operate in the silos. So I can barely understand now what many of my groundwater colleagues are publishing in their little specialties. So the, the idea of the groundwater project then is to get these experts to write so the rest of us can understand them. Uh, and in that sense, it's a democratization of knowledge, not only by publishing free of charge and not only by publishing uh, in a variety of languages, but by publishing so we can all understand it. Um, and that, that's what we're trying to get experts to do. And I certainly know it's hard when you're in a silo to publish so people can understand it. And Sandra, she's in the business of getting people to understand what's going on with, with, uh, with groundwater, which is great. And all, all, all waters. Actually. Exactly. That's the business you're in, Sandra, if, in case you didn't realize. To quote you, Sandra, <laughs> the water cycle is broken, but we can fix it, end quote. What would you say is the main reason that we humans just keep on messing up this very cycle? And what is to be done about it? You touched upon this a, a little bit earlier, but please elaborate. Sure. Uh, you know... We have an interesting relationship with water. You know, it is it is so important to our prosperity, you know, the prosperity of our society, of our economy. And so we have applied the best of our technology and 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 engineering to controlling water and delivering water where and when it's needed. You know, nature in some ways has dealt us a very difficult deck of cards. You know, we don't always have water where we need it, when we need it. And so we've applied really terrific engineering to bring that water to us, to farmers, to cities in the desert, to farmers, of course, who want to grow crops where it's sunny. Well, where it's sunny, you don't always have rain. And so you need to bring the water there. And so we've done a very good job of, of doing that. Um, but in the process, we've also prevented rivers from flowing like rivers. You know, we have 60,000 large dams blocking rivers again, to control water for human prosperity. But that means we have affected the life within the river. We no longer are giving rivers the flows they need to create and sustain the habitats that the rest of life needs. And so we have numbers that are very unsettling to me. Um, for example, you know, the latest Living Planet Index tells us that uh, over the last 50 years, so since 1970, the populations of freshwater vertebrates, so freshwater animals, vertebrates, fish and frogs, has declined by 84%. So that means, you know, for every 100 fish and frogs we had 50 years ago, we now only have 16, right? That's a dramatic loss of life in a very short period of time. And it's partly because we've broken this water cycle. Water isn't moving through the landscape the way it, it, 
naturally would. And so that's why I think solutions that heal the water cycle, replenish it, restore it, repair it, um, are just critical. And as John and I have both alluded to, these can solve multiple problems at the same time. We just don't have time to solve the climate, water, and biodiversity crises in a piecemeal fashion, right? They need to be solved together and they're all connected. So that's a good thing, which means we can have solutions that solve them all at the same time. And I think that's the direction we, we really need to go. And everyone can play a part in that, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, the technology that we have applied uh, to, to control water, and that made me think, you mentioned it somewhere, uh, the Albert Einstein quote. Do you remember it? Do you know which one I mean? <laughs> I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. He said something, I'm paraphrasing, but we cannot solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created the problems. So that tells me we have to think differently. And, and I think that's exactly, exactly. right. Exactly. And it's, it's, uh, there must be a limit to how high, high the, how high the levees and the dams can be. I mean, we can't go on making them higher and higher. There has to be another solution. Now, uh, so this brings us back to the question we began with, uh, the basic water knowledge among non-scientists. How are you both working with adding to that knowledge? What will you say, John? Well, the, the, the groundwater project is intended to bring groundwater knowledge all the way from children on up. But to get, get back to Sandra's point that the water cycle is broken as we're using it, for example, 25% of the sea level rise that's normally attributed to climate change is in fact excess groundwater. It's the groundwater pumped from aquifers, mostly for irrigation. So we're pumping so much water from aquifers to dewater them almost permanently that, that it's a major contributor to uh, sea level rise. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of, of, of where does all this come from, it mostly comes from the type of agriculture we use uh, and the type of engineering we use. Uh, and Sandra mentioned that we need to get to, uh, you know, to dealing with water uh, more in, in a natural context. And that's where all this, all, all this heads, agriculture that doesn't do damage to all parts of our ecological system um, uh, and engineering, that's green, green in the sense that it's gentle. Uh, so, for example, all this excess water that we're pumping out to the oceans needs to be put back in the ground so that it feeds the rivers and wetlands and, and all of the ecology. So the water cycle is so broken uh, that hardly anyone realizes the numbers. It's the numbers that matter. Mm. What about you, Sandra, and, and the work with adding to the knowledge? I mean, you, you are, above all, first and foremost, you're a researcher, but you have also been praised for being a, a master communicator when it comes to uh, questions of, of water. How do you work with spreading the knowledge? That's a really important question. And part of my interest is just expanding what I call the community of concern about water. You know, engineers have been so good in, in so many ways at, at providing us with water that we sort of don't get involved. And I think it's now a time for everyone to see that they can be part of the solution. Um, you know, I spent six years as the freshwater fellow at the National Geographic Society, which was a tremendous opportunity to spread the word about water and, and how we can all be involved. And one of the first things we did um, during my time with National Geographic was build a freshwater footprint calculator. So anyone at any age could go in uh, to the calculator and look at their daily life, look at their diet, look at their use of energy, look at their shopping habits, their material goods, and then look at their household water use and answer questions and come out with their number. What is my personal water footprint? And we would give tips to them about if they wanted to, how they could reduce their water footprint, how they could conserve and be part of the solution. So this was a very popular tool. And I think it was great for education and giving people a way they could, they could get engaged. I completely agree with John too, that we need to educate young people about the water cycle, about water in general. And I just wrote a, uh, an introduction for a National Geographic book for kids on water that will be coming out, I think, in a year and a half, two years, I'm not sure. Um, 
And this is for eight to 12 year olds. And so engaging and educating kids from a very young age, I think can inspire them, motivate them to be, uh, become part of the solution. And also think about maybe, maybe they wanna go into uh, freshwater work and, and make that part of their, their, their life. So I'm I'm really excited about those those mm. things. Now uh, it seems that you agree on a lot of things, but um, John said here in the beginning of this talk that there is in fact a global water crisis. Do you agree on that, Sandra? You know I do agree on that. Um, I think the word crisis is a bit overused, so I tend not to use that word very often. But but I I do think we have a crisis in the way that most of us use that word. Uh, I mentioned the numbers on the decline in freshwater life. Uh, that's a crisis. That is, uh, if you're in a hospital, that's sounding the blue emergency code, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's time to really, really step up and reverse that trend. Uh, for the hundreds of millions of fellow human beings who do not have access to safe drinking water every day, especially for the women and girls who much, must walk you know, long distances to collect water for their families, that is a crisis every day. It prevents girls from going to school. It prevents women from doing other productive activities. So, and, it, and it makes the health of the family at risk. So th that's a crisis every day. And then we have the water, the water and climate crisis. So uh, we absolutely do. And I think we need to see it that way and begin to act with much more urgency than we have. You know, we, we sort of know these things, but we haven't yet reached a point as a society where we recognize that we have to act boldly and we have to act now and we have to scale up these solutions that John and I have been referring to in a, in a very short time. So that crisis, if it breeds that sense of urgency, I'm all for calling it a water mm. crisis. And what about you, John? Um, what, what, from your point of view, what are the, the main impact? Uh, what is the main impact uh, on humans and on nature? So the word, the word crisis then, you know, it, it's, it's, we have to choose it very deliberately. And I've been doing that lately. Um, water is only viewed as a crisis when a drought comes along. So there was a crisis in Cape Town for three years. There was a crisis in Southern California for three years and a crisis in Brazil, Sao Paulo for two years, etc. And as soon as the rainfall comes, people think the crisis is gone. But in, in fact, the, the study of, of, of uh, ice cores uh, and tree rings and other studies, some of which I've been involved with, shows that these long, severe droughts have occurred in the past, um, uh, over the past thousand years. So the big, long droughts are in fact coming at us and are gonna be worse, apparently, because of climate change. So in fact, even though we're not seeing the word crisis on the newspapers, it's coming at us. But for, for four, billion, four, 4 billion of the world's 8 billion people, water is a crisis. There's the billion that Sandra mentioned, and for them it's extreme water poverty. So every day water is a crisis in their lives. And for another 3 billion, then water crises come along in various parts of the year and in various parts of the week. So I think, although the public's getting tired of the term crisis, uh, if, if we don't use it, I, I'm not sure that water can get the attention uh, it needs. Mm. But let's think that there's something very concrete, something very evident. You have the ears of the major decision makers in the world. What would you whisper into those ears? Who wants to begin? I, I can go. Well, I, I would say that although it's politically very unacceptable, we have to deal with the production of food crisis. Um, basically, 70% uh, of the world's food is, is dependent on irrigation or other water use uh, from groundwater, and the groundwater reservoir is being depleted. So unless we deal with how we produce our food and get back to, shall we say, food being produced in harmony with nature or, or whatever we want to call it, unless we deal with that, uh, we can't really make any major progress. So, for example, when we eat personally, we have no idea what the water implications of what we eat are. You know, we, we can read the back of the label of our of our, our milk can or whatever and, and, and see all sorts of things, but we see nothing about its its environmental impact, its water impact. So this would mean then that the political class need to 
need to basically confront probably the most difficult problem at all, which is talking about, about how we grow food and what we eat, uh, etc. Mm. What about you, Sandra? What would you whisper into that ear? I would, I would whisper that we must do two things. Because water is the basis of life for all life on the planet, we need to shrink our human water footprint and then share water, more water with nature and the rest of life. And John just alluded to food, and that is the most important thing we can do in order to shrink our footprint and share more water with nature is, one, produce the food that we're consuming more efficiently. Um, and so irrigation efficiency, more crop per drop, but more nutritional value per drop. We're using a lot of water to grow, you know, feed crops for animals. As John alluded to, that's a very intensive part of our water footprint. So personally, if we reduce our commercial meat consumption by a bit, that reduces our collective water footprint by quite a lot. And then secondly, share that more of that water with nature. So we need to partner, you know, conservationists, businesses, um, farmers and ranchers need to come together and, and work on projects and solutions that use that water more efficiently, put more water back into our aquifers, into our rivers. And we can do this. We have examples of this around the world. There's just not enough of them. So it's not that we don't know how, it's that we're not doing it to scale and we're not doing it quickly enough. Uh, so that's that's what I would hmm. say. Now. 30 years and counting with World Water Week and Stockholm Water Price, of which you are the most recent laureates. What would you say is the importance of, of a week such as this or, or the price that you have just been awarded? Sandra. Oh, I am so grateful for the prize, not just receiving the prize, which I am very grateful for, of course, and honored by. I'm very grateful that the prize exists um, because Every year, the prize shines a light on the importance of fresh water. And there's really nothing else other than a crisis, a drought like we had in Cape Town and so on, that does this. And so, you know, it gets the world who's, who's reading uh, and paying attention to what's going on to focus on, you know, on this important issue, on fresh water. And... And the World Water Week brings us all together uh, to, to talk about water, to get energized about solutions, to share ideas. And so I think the combination of the World Water Week and the Stockholm Prize uh, just elevates the importance of water uh, professionally, but most importantly to the world. And we need that more than ever. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, Sandra has expressed it, I, I think, beautifully. Um, and I'm very grateful that, in fact, this focus on water happens. Uh, personally, I'm very grateful because it allows me to uh, to get some attention for things, things that I, I believe are, are needing attention. It's interesting. We, we scientists very rarely get a platform from which to speak to anybody uh, but our colleagues. Uh, and so having this platform is, is, a, is a wonderful uh, opportunity. Mm, brilliant. Now, to round things up, uh, one final question. Are you a freshwater optimist or a pessimist? John. I'm a genetic optimist, um, and I'm optimistic even when I see no uh, good uh, rational reason for being an optimist. But picking up on what Sandra said, what's amazing now is that the solutions to all the water problems are there in front of us. They've all been tried out somewhere around the world. The scientific and engineering know-how is there in front of us. So we're at this amazing uh, turning point in, in humanity. We've got all the means to solve the big water problems, and now it's just a matter of the public uh, learning about them and putting pressure on, on, the, on the politicians. And what about you, Sandra? Optimist or pessimist? To be honest, it depends which day you ask me that question. Um, I, uh, I do not like to reside in pessimism and despair, even though I have my days uh, where that's the case. Um, but I, I would say I am a realistic optimist. Um, and I became that, I think, a lot from researching my last book, where... 
in, in looking at all the ways in which we've broken the water cycle and all these challenges we have, but then finding that somewhere in the world for each of those challenges, we have a solution happening on the ground in the real world. And so that gives me the opportunity to be a realistic optimist. It's not a pie in the sky kind of thing. We know what to do, but we need to scale it up. And that's where I think education, communication, telling stories that touch the heart, not, not just the mind. You know, we've had the data for, for years and years and years on climate, water, biodiversity, but it hasn't forced us to change yet. And I think more stories that touch the heart as well as the mind maybe can broaden that community of concern and, and help us to really get moving on, on solving the problems that John and I have been talking about. And that gives me optimism also. Thank you so much. It was very nice talking to you. And let's hope the whole world listens to all your wise words and the change will come. So best of luck with your ongoing and your future work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the World Water Week 2021 continues, but please remember to nominate for the 2022 Stockholm Water Prize. And thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>